expecting we, Dan? No. No, you have everyone now, I think, that will be here. Dan is not attending today. Okay, great. Okay. All right. Well, happy Friday, 1st of September, 2023, uh, and to the um, Town of Amherst Solar Bylaw Working Group meeting. Uh, thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, we have a quorum. We have our two staff folks. Um, and um, we can get started. We do have participants from the public, num numbering five at this point. So thank you all from uh, non-committee members for joining us as well for this meeting. <clears throat> um, we will have opportunity for public comments uh, at the end as we, as we always do. Um, so uh, thank you also Stephanie uh, and Chris for pulling together materials and the packet of materials. Uh, I did want to also thank you both for working with Mike Warner uh, to update the GIS um, solar um, uh, model or whatever it's called that we have, uh, platform that we have for the solar feasibility. Uh, and uh, and Mike did add the um, an additional layer that some of you might have been able to take a look at, which I actually was playing with last night, found quite helpful for this, uh, being able to sort of look at um, at, par at, 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 at um, all the other layers, but in combination with the size of parcels uh, that are available uh, in terms of um, small, medium, and large uh, uh, parcel sizes. Uh, so thank you for the town uh, for putting that together. Um, we have an agenda or kind of normal agenda today, but uh, basically we're, um, well, I, I guess to make sure everybody knows on the committee and, and in the public, we do have now an official extension from the town manager to um, keep working towards this um, solar bylaw recommendation uh, to the town council. Uh, and our extension is to until October 6th, um, which uh, is much needed, uh, but still um, that translates to just about a month. Uh, and so um, we have a lot of work in front of us um, and appreciate everybody hanging in there and getting helping us get to the end point. Um, I think uh, we have sort of teed up uh, I think for t for today, as much discussion as we can on on two of the issues that are um, of most importance or or at least worthy of conversation uh, and, and and deliberation on this uh, bylaw, which is with regard to um, I hopefully sort of finalizing our thoughts with regard to uh, how we want to look at um, solar on farms uh, and then making additional progress. Um, on how we want to look at solar and force uh, in, in Amherst. Um, let me also thank uh, Janet for her comments uh, that were added to the packet uh, and thoughts that were added to the packet. And then uh, also very much to Jack for his um, his own, his thoughts, uh, both in, in terms of uh, responding to Janet's comments and, and, uh, and his own, and, and, his expert expertise coming from his uh, water resource committee um, and and background. Uh, so both of those are uh, really good frameworks for us to um, uh, have further discussion on on these issues. Uh, so thank you for your efforts on on that. Um, and um, but before we get into the into the uh, um, meat of the material, let's stick with the agenda. Uh, the first um, part of which, um, I'll pause for a second. Chris, how you doing? <laughs> Hi, I just wondered if you had determined who was taking minutes today. Yes. Yep, uh, that's thank Laura. You. That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right, yep. good. Yep, yep, we took care of that, so thank you. Thank you. Um, Martha, did you have something before we get going? Uh, yeah, I'd just like to make a request that you allow a little time at the end of our meeting to just 
look critically at what are the key issues we have left to do? What's the meeting schedule to get them done? Yeah, in, in fact, the meeting schedule uh, is is a topic that came up and, uh, and um, yeah, we're going to have to address that um, and, and look at that as well. So yeah, let's, um, uh, we'll do that with the, um, when we get to the next meeting schedule and agenda. Um, okay, uh, so uh, we're catching up on the minutes um, and we have two sets of minutes uh, that have been provided in our packet. Um, and the, let's do them chronologically. Uh, so from July 7th, um, we have now draft minutes for review and approval. Um, have people been able to have a chance to review those? Um, and are there any comments, uh, recommendations, thoughts, or a motion to approve those minutes? And the, let me know the, if you'd like me to share them. Yeah. Would anybody find Jack? Would you like them to be shared? Uh, no, I'm just saying I, I make a motion to approve. Um, before we do that, I just these these um, Janet, you prepared prepared these. Um. Yes. Yeah. Okay. They really, just wanted to... They're really they're the long ones, not the Martha short ones. No, okay, no, I got I uh, I just wanted to acknowledge that and thank you for preparing these. Um so but there is a motion uh, to approve them uh from Jack. Is there a second to that motion? Bob, I'll second. Thank you, Bob. Okay, and by um voice vote. So please make sure you're unmuted. Um McGowan. Oh, Not can hear you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm I'm on my son's computers. You were unmuted and now you're muted. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna skip. I'll come back to you, Janet. Breger? Yes. Hanner? Yes. Jemsek? Yes. Pagliarulo? Yes. Brooks? Yes. And McGowan. Yes. Okay. Minutes are approved. Great, thank you. Okay, and now we have the minutes of August 18th that are were also distributed in the packet. And for those, I'd like to thank Martha for preparing those um, and would anybody like those displayed or are there any comments um, on those minutes from August 18th? Um, and if not, is there a motion to approve them? Jack? I'll move to, uh, to approve these minutes. Thank you, Jack. Second. Bob, yes. I think Janet snuck in first, so we'll go with Janet's. We'll, we'll shake it up a bit this time. We'll go with Janet second. Okay, and uh, the voice vote, please be unmuted. McGowan? Yeah. Yes. Breger? Yes. Hanner? Yes. Jemsek? Uh, yes, I, I and I just I wanted to thank everyone for letting me drop out of the of the note taking. I just a little bit uh needed a break and overwhelmed so thanks everyone uh did i say yes yes <laughs> tag the arulo sorry laura i'm not sure i heard you yes yes okay thanks brooks yes okay minutes are approved my agenda go. Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, next up is staff updates. Um, and let's go uh, 
with that, Stephanie, anything on your end? I do not have anything at this time. All right, thank you. Um, Chris? Yeah, I just wanted to report that um, two things. One is that Doug Marshall, the chair of the planning board, sent me a set of written comments um, <clears throat> based on the planning board's review of the draft solar bylaw that they did, um, forget when that was, I think it was August 2nd. So I will be uh, looking at those and incorporating them as um, as needed. Um, and the other thing I wanted to let everyone know, and maybe Dwayne said this before I came in, but Mike Warner of um, our IT department uh, made some improvements to the map, that interactive map that um, we can use to see uh, where feasible places are to put solar. Um, and he added um, information about the size of the parcels. So you can click on the map uh, on a certain layer and you get to a map that shows, you know, parcels that are zero to five. And then I think it's five to 10 and then 10 to 15 and 15 to 20 or something like that. So you get a sense of what are the small parcels and what are the larger parcels. And that was something that Dwayne had asked for. So that's all I have to report. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, okay, um, Martha and then Janet. May we get a copy of Doug Marshall's comments? I mean, were they substantive or just sort of wording? Um, uh, yes, certainly you can have a copy of those. Yeah, I'll send them to you. Okay, thank you. Chris, if you just send them to me, I'll send them to everybody um, and include yep. them in the packet. Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, I think Janet was on that as well. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. Um, let's go with any staff updates. Uh, any committee, any members of, of aligned committees? Um, just briefly from the ECAC committee, um, we invite everybody to... Um, visit us at the uh, block party. We're going to have a table, the Amherst block party. I forget when that is actually, but it's sometime in September, I think. Um, September uh, 21st. September 21st. So um, uh, it's always a great scene um, and fun. So look forward to people um, visiting ECAC booth there um, amongst many other booths. <laughs> I'm not sure if we have the swag <laughs> to to attract people, but we'll have some some uh, uh, good information for folks. Um, also, um, just from um, the clean energy extension, um, everybody here on this, uh, I include you on an email blast we did on inviting everybody to the solar forum, Western Mass Solar Forum, virtual forum, um, over four Tuesdays in September, starting right after Labor Day. Um, and uh, incur encourage you or, or, or um, certainly invite you to um, join us for that. When is that doing again? Solar Forum uh, four times remotely What starting? It's all remote. Yeah, it's all virtual and remote starting at noon uh, each Tuesday in September. Laura, you should have gotten an email from me or, or actually from CEE Solar that came from. Okay, I'll look. Um, yeah. All right, good. Any other staff updates? Okay, any other, I guess uh, we had a separate item for committee updates. Uh, so uh, any any updates from our liaison from the planning or water resources committees? Um, I think Jack will will talk talk separately uh, about your comments and so forth. All right, super. Okay, uh, so let's then get into our topics for today. Um, and I guess um, there's two sets. Um, one is uh, that I'd like to cover today. One is. Um, We've had some good discussions on solar and farms. Um, and um, I think we came to some um, settling point 
on that, um, which Chris has now provided in bylaw language. Uh, and so I want to have some time today to go through those and provide and, and have the opportunity to respond to any of, uh, of what Chris has put together for that uh, and try to put that to, um, uh, to to bed, if you will. Um, and then and then we have the issue with um, uh, solar and, and forest. And I guess um, we, we want to cover that first. Um, if I um, because there's been some helpful um, uh, input from uh, both Janet and from Jack particularly. Uh, we wanted to give other people opportunity to um, respond to those. Um, and I think Stephanie, what was the intent? What the idea was to share these, share the screen on these. So um, I was, so yeah. So Janet had sent an email to the group. Yeah. Um, and Jack provided written response. Right. My concern is that I think we need to, um, I thought it would be easiest to just view the version with Jack's comments. Because they include Janet's. Because they include Janet's original mm -hmm. with Jack's yeah. comments yeah. Um, and review that document. Um, yes. Because I, I'm, I am going to say now that I feel that we're treading on open meeting law violations mm -hmm. when people are commenting on, on each other's work via email outside of this meeting format. So I think we're covered if we share this document and you both have an opportunity to uh, comment on what you wrote and your responses, Jack. Um, I think that would probably be the best way to handle it. So I can share the screen. Yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you. And then, and uh, and use this as, as an opportunity for um, Janet and Jack to sort of make bring their points forward, uh, but also um, have other people um, provide thoughts and comments and their own their own thoughts on this. And I think the idea here is is uh, to get us in a position where we can then sort of think about, okay, what is the framework we want to um, move forward uh, with with Chris uh, with regard to the bylaw language itself. Um, and I think one of the issues that will be raised or we want to consider um, and um, um, Martha, I know you've had some comments on this as well, is um, is whether we need to have language specific to force uh, or whether the quote unquote restrictions that we find pertinent to force can be covered in um, appropriately in other sections, uh, particularly with regard to stormwater management um, and soils uh, and, and so forth. And I don't want to put words in your mouth, Martha, but that 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 um, that's um, not something we can we can um, uh, sort of bring to the to the to the discussion as we look at Janet and Jack's um, uh, um, contributions here. So, Stephanie, if you um, sure can do the sharing, that'd be great. Okay, you should be seeing this. August thirty yeah. first. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, I I guess I leave it to you, Dwayne, as to how you want to have um, Janet and Jack respond to this, or maybe Jack wants to just give a quick overview. I will say that both documents are part of the online packet. So, if members of the public are interested, these documents are both in the online packet for public access. Yeah. And I don't see Jack's red stuff yet, but I presume that's- So that's later. further yeah. down. Yeah. I just yeah, didn't exactly. know if Jack- Oh, okay, okay, there we go. Yeah, right, exactly, yeah. So we could just start here. Um, Go ahead, Jack. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can, you know, do the intro part and then um, have Janet provide her her viewpoint but so i just you know with the do you want me to yes to start off okay so uh or janet has her hand up um well 
Let me just hear quickly from Jana in terms of what how what her thoughts would be. I mean, uh, you uh, do you have anything you want to say to to start, Janet, or or uh, should we get? Yeah, if mm -hmm. I could just um, so these aren't my comments. So what I had at the beginning of the memo I sent was my ideas based on what Aaron Jakes had written, and so it's not like I'm not an authority on drinking water recharge or forest sequestration or how groundwater, you know, rainwater moves. And so I, I didn't put, I, what, I, this, what I wrote was a summary of her comments to the um, drinking water, the, um, the white, the, the Amherst um, groundwater, whatever that long committee is. And so I don't really wanna get into like a back and forth of what Aaron said versus what Jack said, because I don't really, but I, I do, know that her comments, her summary comments and her, her information was important. I feel like it was sort of lost a little bit. Um, we had her come talk and we, was, she was sort of peppered with questions about her job. And at the end of that, I kept on trying to ask her about these comments she had written and the conclusions. And I said, do you, know, do you still have this opinion? And she said, it's not an opinion, it's based on research. And so I think that that's why I sent these to say, this is what Aaron Jakes had said, and we need to deal with them. And I, I, you know, I can I draw I myself drew larger conclusions on how that applied to our work. But I don't want to. I'm not saying these are not my comments. This is literally a summary of what of Aaron Jakes' comments, which was supported by a lot of right. citations okay. to research papers. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's an important clarification. I think that was clearly stated in your memo, uh, but important to to. Um, uh, make sure everybody's um, aware of that uh, in the context of your 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 memo. Um, so go ahead, Jack. Yeah, I, I just want to say that you know, Janet. Uh, you know, we're just having discussion here. She she brought up some points that the uh, you know Aaron's were uh, comments were unique on uh, on the white paper and. You know, I put in the segment there where, you know, kind of summarize the discussion of the Water Supply Protection Committee uh, of our review of comments uh, that we received on the white paper. And the majority of Aaron's comments, um, I suggested be deferred to here uh, with us. So uh, which is what we're doing now. So that's all, you know, appropriate. And that was a plan. Uh, but I just wanted to say that, you know, the white paper deals with. Uh, Focus only on uh, water resources and the potential impact uh, of solar um, on on water resources, whether it be um, you know public water supply well, private wells, um, and then also you know stormwater you know management uh, concerns with regard to you know surface water wetland impacts. We kind of looked at all that. But our main charge was for because the, the water supply protection committee is more for the community wells in Amherst. But again, we have the expertise on that committee that we just, you know, we looked at all those things. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, clarify. And I also, you know, I listened to uh, uh, Kate uh, Valentine's uh, video that was linked and, you know, kind of reread. Uh, Aaron's comments, and then came up with you know what I have written here. But the, the you know the main thing is, and I you know I see this time and time again with regard to you know forests and their unique property in terms of uh, protecting groundwater. But um, the I just I think that the point is is that forests are undeveloped, and undeveloped areas have that unique nature of not polluting. Uh, groundwater uh, or or water in general because they're undeveloped and so aren't pastures and grassland and forests and grassland are right up neck and neck in terms of their benefit with regard to uh, water quality and water quantity and I think that 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 point gets lost how important pastures are and forests and it's really, you know, undeveloped 
properties are important to uh you know maintaining our water resources to to you know and then we kind of fit in developed areas you know where people got to live and work uh into that <laughs> equation so and anyway the the, the main point and when it which also is kind of buried is that force uh do take away uh from groundwater recharge because they have such a significant evapotranspiration component uh compared to grasslands uh so which i call pasture which could be agricultural you know or or pasture but i'm just calling forest pasture so uh pastures have uh the ability uh, they have a lower loss of precipitation to evap evaporative processes and transpiration and it's just it's just it's just the hydrology and that's just the fact of the matter um and so i mean i think that's important to note and then the other uh point i made uh, in that introduction was that there are studies that show that placement of solar panels on top of a pasture increases the groundwater recharge for that particular parcel. So you've got it like a hierarchy. Um, forests have the least groundwater recharge and then pastures and then solar on pasture has the highest recharge. So it just keep that in mind you know, with regard to water quality. So with that said, you know, the water quality aspects, I think are uh, pasture and forest, the water quality benefits are, are you know, pretty much on equal footing. Uh, solar does, you know, introduce, you know, foreign material onto the uh, developed property, but the materials that are brought in are, fairly inert they don't have they don't leach chemicals uh, apart from that or the battery installations and that's that's a different argument which we have discussed and you know but they're highly containerized um i know martha brought up the the, the situation in york and that that seems to be like a, a narrow segment of the batteries that just weren't proven and you know collectively kind of failed so we definitely don't want that type of battery installed in Amherst, whatever uh, that manufacturer and that that model. Um, but and then you know and then you know we really were emphasizing how the the uh, negative impression of solar developments came from poor uh, management of of stormwater, you know, best management practices along with erosion control and just knowing what's out there initially and, and putting in preventative uh, uh, you know designs there to control uh, runoff and that so it's, it's it's like any other development project it really needs to have eyes on it and be built properly with regard to the management uh, you know during the construction and and afterward so that's the gist of of you know what I wouldn't want to add but I think we should have a discussion on some of uh the other comments you know that Aaron had and and um Kate Ballantyne that that Jana you know brought up all right thank you Jack um yeah I mean I think the, in my mind it's sort of I'm trying to you know break it down into um um the 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 construction period um and perhaps the, the the most the biggest vulnerability in terms of stormwater sediment runoff and so forth erosion uh is during that construction period and maybe the first year or two of the establishment of the uh of the ground cover 
and, and maybe that's something to talk about in terms of are there restrictions or requirements with regard to ground cover. Um, um, and, and then separately, Jack, and there were some com there is some comments in in uh, what Janet put together uh, and and Aaron and so forth with regard to um, buffer zones uh, with uh, to uh, and distances from from water recharge drinking water recharge areas and then drinking and, and then private wells and we can talk about that um and um and then there were some other questions that Aaron had sort of raised with regard to the introduction of other chemicals in terms of soil amendments or sprays for cleaning uh cleaning or herbicides that might be um used for the uh, for the establishments of these ground covers and so forth. I think that's an issue we might want to take a look at um, um, and have and, and maybe have some expertise here. Um, so those are sort of my thoughts in terms of maybe categories of things to, to uh, sort of discuss and, and try to see if we can put that together in a, in a, uh, in some forms of, of uh, bylaw language and restrictions or recommendations. Um, but let me hear from uh, from Janet and then anybody else who wants to sort of make a comment or express their thoughts on Janet's um, memo. Again, not her opinions, but what she uh, compiled uh, from others uh, and then Jack's um, comments as well. Go ahead, Janet. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jack. I appreciated those clarifications or just information for sure. I wonder, one of the things I was wondering, and I, I actually reading my memo, which I wrote quickly before I left, and I, I wish I had written something else, which is, you know, I was thinking about, I live near the Lawrence Swamp, and that's where I get my water from. And so, you know, there are wells in along the bike path that you could see that we share, I think, with Belchertown. And then there's this huge area of protection, which is the Lawrence Swamp, and I think beyond that, because that's the recharge area for the wells. And so... One of the questions, and I'm, I might be a little bit um, behind in terms of revisions, but one of the big concerns I had was not just saying um, I wasn't worried about runoff from panels into you know a private well. I was worried that the entire recharge area for the private wells was not protected, and I, I kind of I'm not assuming that, but I think there's probably it probably covers a lot of that forested area. So is that mapped? And you know, can we can we pull up a map and say, you know, this section is on well water, and we should protect the recharge area, not just for quantity but for quality, and also with the idea that we don't, you know, until you figure out what the recharge area, you don't know what you're affecting. And so, do we can we pull that up on the map and say the, all these homes are on private wells, and not just protecting like a hundred feet from the well, but the whole what we think the recharge area has that been looked at? Because I think. Um, I saw some language saying that, um, you know, protecting the aquifer recharge protection district and the watershed pr protection district. So I just wondered, do have we protected the recharge area for those wells? And you know, what to, you know, where 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 are those wells? Let me make my my understanding of this, and then uh, Bob, and then Laura for sure. Um, one, I think, I mean, the Lawrence Swamp, swamp there's that protected area that is not going to see solar development within the region that the town um, and, and maybe the state has designated as the recharge area. Um, the private wells is a separate issue. Uh, my understanding is there are rules and regulations, uh, particularly with regard to septic systems, which seem to be the most risk to those wells. Um, and there are rules and regulations about distances, I think, 100 feet mm -hmm. uh, from those to protect uh, that purpose. And I think what we need to discuss is there is there any reason to believe that a solar array would be at greater greater risk um, uh, to these uh, wells than a septic system that's can be fairly close by? Um, and, and 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 then also to get to your point of what are we protecting against? Um, according to Jack, which seems reasonable, you actually get more water, uh, groundwater, uh, because less is taken up by the trees in this case. 
uh, and there's um, uh, and what can we do uh, and what what is there anything we need to do with regard to concerns about contamination uh, uh, of the of the groundwater uh, beyond erosion control and so forth. But um, and and uh, there doesn't and the question of whether there's any any concerns about potential leakages, contamination from the solar array and the battery system. So um, I think I think Dwayne, what I'm trying to say is the water recharge area, it's I'm not talking about contamination from the array, but alterations in the water recharge area, you know, in terms of the quality of the water. So that's what I think that's what Aaron is saying is that there's going to be impacts to the recharge area, but maybe I'm, so maybe we should go down to, it's not just, I'm not worried about hazardous materials coming off the right. I'm just saying that this water recharge area isn't protected in a whole. This, Again, I but it, is it protected from what? But let's hear from Bob, please. The, yeah, for, um, so I do have quite a bit of experience working in forest hydrology and vernal pools. Um, I think that if the restriction pr protections that we, uh, the regulations we have for septic systems are probably more than, they're, they're the most potentially hazardous. And they're, if we meet those with dry wells, we're more than adequately meeting any possible threat from solar. But as far as Janet, I mean, what she's asking is impossible. Every well is different. I mean, the soil conditions, the groundwater, it, it's impossible. You'd have to do some kind of tracer study to figure out what the recharge area is for every individual well in town. That's not going to happen. And I think if we just use the septic system um, restrictions, uh, we'd be more than adequate protection for, and I don't know how many groundwater wells, drinking water wells there are in the town. Um, and I think that's an important thing. But I think the existing regulations that protect them from septic are more than adequate. Thank you, um, and appreciate you know uh, the expertise and experience you have on that, Bob. Laura. Um, yeah, I just want to say so. I appreciate um, Bob's comments and expertise here because that's certainly a lot of expertise. Um, but I want to clarify one thing. So my understanding. Of, um, what, if you could speak just a little bit louder, right, that'd be super My familiar. understanding of what, what the attorney told us was that it's all about public health and safety and that we can um, draft, you know, the bylaw to protect public drinking water, but that going in so much to protect, not that we wouldn't want to, but legally speaking, um, protecting individual well water sources does not fall into the public realm. And there's actually been case law, if, if I'm understanding correctly, in Massachusetts where um, an individual well, they had concern it would be impacted. And, and I also just say that, you know, coming from the solar industry, um, I have, you know, there's no runoff from solar. I mean, it's, it's uh, incredibly um, benign installation, especially in comparison to, you know, when we're looking at other things like commercial buildings, you know, residential complexes, parking lots, um, but that actually, you know, going so far to protect individual well water uh, is outside of our jurisdiction, so. Thanks, Laura. All right, um, Martha. Uh -huh. Yes, I just wanted to respond to Laura's comment on, you know, saying that private wells were an individual thing. I, I took a zoning workshop actually a year ago or so in preparation for this committee. And the emphasis there was, yes, you, you weren't supposed to tailor zoning to say one individual or one individual's property. But if you had a neighborhood, if you had a group in some particular category, that was perfectly legal. And in this case, we have one corner of Amherst up there in the Northeast corner. I live in South Amherst. So, you know, it's somewhere way up there uh, that has this special category of having private wells. And so I think that 
uh, is a case where the town does have an obligation to protect the quote, health, safety and welfare uh, of those residents as a group. I mean, that's not to uh, you know, say one way or the other about our discussion here. But I think then when we get down to the bylaw, I think we just want to kind of look at whether we set any particular limits on size or limits on setbacks or, you know, there aren't too many issues really when we get into the wording of the bylaw, I think. Uh, but I think as we go through it step by step, we'll see the places where we might uh, want to discuss a, a specific uh, number of a of a limit or something. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. Thanks, Martha. Jack. Yes. Yeah, so, um, just to follow up, uh, the Mass DEP, you know, prior or you know, anticipating, you know, the smart program in the state. You know, came up with this uh, a guideline with regard to uh, you know solar panels and perhaps support of of pumping stations uh, that support the community water supply wells. And so, you know, th this is the Mass DEP looking at state groundwater, and the state uh, and the state is in control of its groundwater. It's not federally controlled. The state has responsibility for uh you know being the steward of of groundwater but their document you know they already have a zone one which is 400 feet uh protection which severely limits uh what can be uh uh you know built within that zone and basically what they said was they would prefer that this uh solar not be built within 400 feet uh as similar to anything else basically within the zone ones but then with that you know outside of 400 feet the solar uh you know would be acceptable so that that's a, a guidance document that very detailed in nature so that was one guidance that we had when looking at private wells and um you know when and then the point i made you know in this in this letter is that a private well takes pretty much like a teaspoon of water compared to a swimming pool size of what a community well takes. So just think in your mind when you're when you're when you have a little straw and you're taking ground you're taking water out of a some sort of container uh and the the area of influence of a private well tends to be very small but as you know and that's where I say the zone of influence. So that 100 feet it, you know, put that into perspective. That's that's a lot when you think about a community well being 400 feet, and you're taking, you know, a thousand, ten thousand times less water. You know, the 100 feet is is protective. But I I think that we left it out there that it would be somewhere between 100 and 400 feet that we would recommend within this bylaw in terms of the zone of protection for for the private well. So I think that's what I want to say on, on that. And, and then and then also just add to what um, uh, Bob said, that truly, you know, for a molecule of water, you know, where that camp comes from, that, that actually enters the well, you know, it could be, you know, further than 100 feet, for sure. It could be miles. <laughs> but overall, the majority of the water comes from, you know, close by. But especially when you're talking about bedrocks, you know, bedrock fractures, the movement in bedrock is is so complex uh, compared to, you know, an overburden well, a dug well uh, that takes from, you know, the sand and gravel aquifer or the, or the till or whatever it's drawing water from. Uh, but I figured after we're talking about this, I we, we can go over the comments or I can even go over the comments that Aaron had bulleted because they, they're worth discussing, I think. Um, but we'll finish this discussion first. All right, good. Appreciate that. Okay, uh, Janet, and then uh, maybe we can sort of figure out where we want to head into in terms of actually thinking about what we want to have in this bylaw. Um, 
I was trying to lower my hand. I'm on my son's computer, and I, I, I was gonna. I agree with Jack. Let's look at her comments, and, um, and I'm just kind of wondering, like, with Bob and Jack, like, if there's private wells all in this area, does it make sense to protect it all because they're all drawing from sort of the same area? So, I'd love to look at Erin's comments, and I'd love to figure out how to undo this hand. So, ah, there it goes. <laughs> Well, how about that, Jack? Just in or, or Bob, in terms of okay, so now we have numerous personal wells, and I'm not sure what numerous is, but there's a number of them up there, um, and they're each they're each um, drawing from their local region, but who knows exactly how far? But there's sort of a matrix of them. Mm -hmm. um, is that does that start becoming a little bit more like a public uh, public drinking water supply or or uh, how would you sort of think about that it's not it, they're spread out but there's a, a several of them yeah jack please. okay so so the, the the history on 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 land development associated with with parcels that have on-site you know a private water well and an on-site septic system the um the basis for why a lot of our lots are you know minimum one acre two acre some towns have five acres but that's all based on on-site management of water so that particular lot basically can be self-sustaining uh, uh, based on the amount of recharge that comes on to that property uh based on you know on the annual rainfall basically so what and and then also giving buffers similar to you know the 100 foot you know necessary so if you have a 100 foot buffer then you know that's 200 feet wide 200 by, by 200 is a one acre uh size property so that's sort of like how all that fits together of why these single family lots tend to be seem to be oversized right with one acre you know why aren't they a quarter acre sort of thing but that's it. All goes back to a hydrologic uh, uh, argument way back in the seventies, eighties of of how that came to be. So that, that's a little backdrop on there. So with that said, it, the lots um, are already kind of uh, sufficient in size to provide the level of protection on a uh, lot by lot basis. However, we are aware that they do have water quantity issues because they're up on the hill and they have reported, you know, problems there. So ironically, you know, what would be a good neighbor in terms of increasing recharge is what I just stated is no, not force. So, I mean, ironically, but, um, but anyway, I think they're, they're, they're good and you know we, we wouldn't want to put a something that is going to withdraw a lot of water in that vicinity and that's the only way we can help that that neighborhood i think eventually the town's going to get you know water and sewer up there but there's too many other things on their plate right now uh to consider that because it is going to be an expensive capital uh project so that's all on that particular topic. All right, good. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jack. Mm -hmm. So, would you mind, um, Stephanie, uh, just blowing that up just one notch? Okay. So, you know, here we're talking about mature and old growth forests, and it made me, you know, think of Kate Valentine's video. There, there's something special about forests, for sure. Uh, the continuity of these things. Uh, what I, the takeaway I got from her video was that, you know, uh, segmentation is something that um, impacts forests, and. And then so there's, you know, there's extra value for having, if you have a significant size, you know, force that you kind of want to keep that intact and not kind of chop it off and that sort of thing. So, um, and then mature and old growth, I mean, 
I don't think we have, well, we don't have an old growth force in, in Amherst is my understanding, but if we have, you know, mature forests, those, those are all, you know, they're important for sure. Um, but just going through her uh, comments, their high infiltration and percolation of moisture, uh, moderate storage of water in shallow soils, fairly abundant water storage in deep soils, moderation of peak flows during extreme storm events, sustained low flows during dry seasons, provides critical ecological and societal functions such as filtration of drinking water. So, you know, the, the thing is that undeveloped pasture pretty much provide all those things as well, but they have a different set of unique ecological and societal uh, functions. So it's more undeveloped land versus developed land. That's where these things, that that's the positive of, of land. <laughs> if it's undeveloped, it has value for sure. So um, I don't know if anyone has any questions on that. And then, uh, so the clear cutting impacts, uh, we have listed increased mobilization of nutrients and uh, water temperatures, increased light, increased suspended solids and streams, increased erosion, increased nutrient uh, load on streams and negative impacts on water quality. So, you know, certainly there's there's a lot of truth to, to some of these. Um, and it depends, you know, clear cutting happens by virtue, I think my understanding is management of force. That might, clear cutting might happen, but it's in small, smaller regions and, and then you have growth that, you know, replaces it sort of thing. But here, I think from our perspective, we're looking at, you know, converting forest to, to pasture. So yeah, things will be, you know, changing. Certainly the, the, the temperatures are going to be higher, uh, from a, from a, a forest to a, a pasture conversion, definitely more light. Um, the, the suspended solids and streams is more a temporary aspect that would be managed by, you know, the erosion uh, and control measures, uh, you know, in that conversion, um, same for erosion. And, and then the water quality aspect is, again, I, I question, you know, if you have, if you're just going from you're not putting in parking lot, you're not putting in septic systems, you're not, you know, putting in dry wells, uh, the impact on water quality is is insignificant if 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 there is any, basically, I think, uh, when we're looking at clear cutting. So, and again, you're increasing recharge, groundwater recharge in these areas uh, when you clear cut. Uh, anybody have any questions on on that? Uh, so, and then the clear cutting of our watershed, you know, because so this son, I, I just a little bit out of context, and, and no, no offense to to Aaron, but it it just doesn't make sense in the reference. I was just pointing out that it. Um, so I, I don't I don't really know what to say about about this, but um, it's a change, right? So clear cutting is impacting. And it's, you know, it's been done for hundreds of years. The the nature, you know, bounces back. And, you know, it, it, yeah, it, it is it is what it is. But um, this article, this is, uh, uh, who is it? Oh, Del, Delpla. So that, that was based on climate change and, you know, looking at drought and what's drought going to do to you know certain regions and and that it wasn't really focused on forests but anyway uh janet you have so um uh, this is what you said about what you said before so what i took away from the kate valentine is 
that forests and probably pastures do a better jo job in terms of water quality than a stormwater management system. You know, that's kind of the, the, you know, she did the physical showing of, you know, water that had been, you know, purified by going through a wetland or a forest system versus what you get from um, a stormwater management system. So that's one point, and I wondered what you thought of that. And then um, the other, I'm sorry, I lost my second point. Just stay on that one then. Yeah, well, okay. So for the stormwater, there's a couple of things that are in play there. The stormwater is always uh, has the goal of preserving, you know, the peak runoff of pre-development to post-development. Mm -hmm. So it has a it has a mission there in terms of knocking off the peak flows to to be as they are, uh, in, you know, in, in the current uh, day. So that's where these detention or uh, retention ponds and uh, uh, swales that allow infiltration and that that's where all those come into play to pre preserve that and that is um and that's and that's so the, you know so the real situation that we, we we would be concerned about is that we have stormwater management because of the increased runoff from developed surfaces like pavement and things like that overall i think the way water sees a uh, ground mounted you know, solar array is a pasture. Sure, there are drip lines around each of the individual panels, you know, the six foot by three foot panels, but that that dissipates and averages out and you you rarely see any. I don't think any erosion occurs from, uh, you know, think of your roof line, you know, dripping near a house. That's a lot of water. These these solar panels are much smaller, and they're just not enough energy of the water running off in the solar panel to actually erode uh, the soil, especially if you know, there's vegetation. And there is vegetation on all the ground-mounted solar uh, fields here. Uh, so that, so I think, is all I can say about that. I'm not sure um, if there was something else that that was intended in that statement about you know stormwater management systems not being uh ideal <laughs> but they they work for you know one reason is is controlling runoff we don't want flooding off off the site or sedimentation running off and and so, choking up streams and things like that so, so jack can i so i think what they were saying was fil filtration of rainwater through natural like through the forest is better it does a better job of removing things and clearing the ground cleaning the groundwater than you know a clear cut or an array so do you know what i mean it's like their the filtration has a better result in terms of water quality of the groundwater so i understand what you're saying about yeah. the stormwater management systems because we do that all the time it's just kind of controlling the flow yes so again, you know, and I, I would say, you know, pastures, uh, you know, they have, you know, the root system within the grasses, the filtration of the soil, they basically do the same thing. I mean, the the, the difference is that the forests have the, the canopy that retain a lot of water that directly evaporates back into the atmosphere, never gets to the ground and and that sort of thing. And during drought, the, the the root system of a tree is much deeper and will draw from the water table uh, in its you know drought response situation. Whereas the grass, it, it just goes kind of dormant, effectively dies, but renews itself. You know, I'm not a biologist, but um, but yeah, the, the the magical aspect of forests is the same magical aspect of pastures in terms of how it is able to uh, uh, kind of buffer the chemicals within precipitation because you know, we still have acid rain, you know? So it the water, you know, needs to pass through soil to buffer itself and get the pH right and, you know, filter out other trace contaminants that are, that is in rainfall. So pasture forest, but they both do, you know, a good job. Okay.
Great. Thanks, Jack. Yeah, mm -hmm. Let's keep, keep going through this of what you find important to. Okay. Yeah. So the ground mounted uh, photovoltaic impacts. So increased shading, uh, reducing rain and atmospheric deposition, that, that, that's got it backwards there. Uh, <clears throat> It in, the solar panels will increase uh, uh, groundwater uh, recharge due to the shading, uh, basically. So lower temperatures, uh, less evaporation. Um, and then the wind, you know, I've, I've not I've not seen anything published about this being, you know, a factor, but I'm sure there's there's some maybe measurable effect you know like off a lake uh and then potential alteration of key ecosystem services and plant soil processes that's a different matter obviously you know if there's you know critical habitats associated with any you know parcel that's going to change with the solar development so that always needs to be you know mapped out and characterized separately as part of the you know permit review process, no you know no doubt. So um, significant modification of the, I believe that soil water content and uh, water water holding content or something and, and soil temperatures uh, significant. Um, uh, the temperatures will go up, uh, the, you know, but the. If it's a forest to pasture change, yeah, the, the whole habitat sort of uh, changes significantly. There's there's no argument about that. Uh, changes in microclimate, evaporation, precipitation, uh, true, yeah. Um, and then the last series, yeah. So, you know, each parcel is different. Um, You know, so you know there, there is there is there is change, and and then I guess you know it's the job of the you know permit granting authority to take all the information in. What we have for guidance is usually these you know is it you know near wetland? Is the wetland buffer being honored? Is there a critical you know uh, wildlife habitat associated with it? Are there other things? All those are are reviewed currently for any you know land development you know project so i think that's that's all i got to say if there's any questions and there might be a little bit more stephanie Okay, it's important to note that vegetation soils and water are all interconnected and changes to vegetation and soils will undoubtedly impact uh, nearby surface and groundwater quality. Uh, not, you know, uh, depends what that change is. I mean, again, that's that's why there's all these reviews. That's why we have a conservation commission, the planning board, zoning board of appeals. Um, but, you know, in general, what we're talking about is introducing new hazardous or potentially hazardous materials and oils and that sort of thing, which don't belong there in the first place, and having that being released to the environment. That's where, you know, the degradation happens. And that's, those sorts of things are not associated with solar arrays. Um, many infiltration stormwater dust management practices are inappropriate to sites in areas of groundwater and surface water protection. Um, okay, so I'm just seeing what I, what I wrote here. It depends on how your logic setting applies to developments that involve the introduction of, yeah. So again, um, I think, you know, you look at the processes, you wanna control the, the, the runoff, so that's not exasperated, you know, versus what it is currently. And then you don't want it introducing pollutants into the groundwater 
or nearby surface waters. So I think, you know, I think we're pretty good here in general for the solar array type projects that we're addressing in our bylaw. And then that last section, I uh, I really don't, I, I don't think that there needs to be any sort of soil investigation associated with solar array uh, uh, projects. I really don't. Uh, now the MEPA threshold is something that maybe someone else can answer, but that, you know, certainly we need to be consistent with, with MEPA, um, uh, you know, within our bylaw, which I'm sure Chris is taking care of. I think that's all I have. All right. I want to thank you again, Jack, for um, pulling these uh, thoughts and, and um, experiences together to share with, with the group. Um, really helpful. Um, any um, feedback for Jack or questions for Jack or, or um, comments? All right, Dwayne, I'm sorry, I don't have my raise hand feature. Oh, um, yeah. huh. But I, in just in looking this, I think the the bottom line for at least me it was um, way at the beginning, and I'm sorry if I'm giving anyone motion sickness by moving this document, but um, I think the the point was that Janet made a kind of recommendation in here, and I think this is the, of all of, of everything that you just reviewed, I think this is the bottom line, and Janet, I don't know if this is the proposal that you still want to make for this. I just wanted to point it out because I think really this is the the bottom line of what Janet was trying to convey. And Janet, again, I'm not trying to speak for you. I just wanted to get back to this kind of summary of recommendation. Um, so you can maybe address these points and then maybe move on from there. Yeah, appreciate that, Stephanie. And that's where I wanted to go was like, okay, so what we, ha we have all this really pertinent information and some science-based information. Um, and uh, where do we go from here? So we could start with uh, Janet, maybe you throw out your recommendation for a framework. We'll get a sense of that. Um, I'd like to sort of think about, okay, what are the, what are the, um, what, what if any are the special provisions we would want to have with regard to force? Um, and uh, and what are those? Uh, what would those be? Uh, or are there are these provisions well covered under um, other parts of the um, bylaw that would be universal universally applied? All right, Janet. Um, so I so my recommendations were based on. I mean, it's pretty pretty much what I've said is that we have an unmapped, you know, drinking water recharge area for five percent of the population. If something happens to that, we, they don't really have an alternative. And so I would love to pull up the map and just look at the area that we're talking about. Because, um, And so the also is that this has been a proposed forest reserve for decades, I think. And it's in, the, um, it's in some map I have of, um, I think, based on the, um, I, I know I'm so, not so smart this morning, but um, it's based on the open space and recreation plan as a suggested forest reserve. It's not a big area of town, but it's really it has a critical resource for drinking water for the people living in it. And also it's like our only forested area. And as we hear over and over from the state, this is what we're supposed to protect and expand. So I just thought there's a lot of importance to this area. Why not just implement the plan anyway, and then implement the state plan and implement the climate action plan, which says protect your natural working lands. And so I just thought, let's just take it off. It's not a big part. Um, but I also think, can we pull up the map and say, oh, there's 65 or 130 households in this area. It's also potentially can be more residential development. And that, uh, you know, one of the things that everybody's been saying is like, well, you know, why are we treating solar differently than, you know, residential, you know, development? And, and it just sounds like maybe we should just take that off as a rec and recommend town council protect this area for its ecological services, its drinking water services. Um, it's, you know, so, but is there a way to pull that up and just get a sense? Because I know we can do a map layer of um, lots, which I think pretty much correlate with a house. 
Um, I also, you know, so I, I also don't, you know, the, one of the issues for me was the uncertainty. I completely understand what Bob Brooks is saying is that, you know, if you were going to map that stony rocky area and how water travels underground, you know, we'd never be able to do that. So to me, when you have uncertainty and an important resource, I would err on the side of protecting it or being a little more comprehensive instead of less and living in a sea of regrets, which we do now for probably any. All right. Um, Bob? Yeah. Oh, hang on. Okay. So I did respond to Stephanie about this, but <laughs> it was inappropriate. So I'm going to re try to reiterate. Uh, first of all, this four, I did look at that on the map. And somebody, it looks like somebody took a magic marker and drew an oval <laughs> in Northeast Amherst. I mean, it's has no no legal um, back. It's just somebody drew an oval on a map. So it's just kind of made up. The other thing, and, and was because in that same packet, we had the attorney's letter. And if you read the first answer in that letter, it says we he recommends we should not um, just by fact, by... Um, we should not just prohibit solar development in the A zoning um, classification or in broad areas. And that's what Janet's suggesting here, that we just draw the, take this oval and say, okay, no solar there, just by fiat. And I don't think that's really what the attorney says we should be doing. And I don't think it's appropriate. And it's not even a legally recognized area. Appreciate that. Uh, Martha? Okay, I think I think maybe it would all become clear if we start stepping through Chris's latest uh, draft for the for the forest provisions and so on, because it might be that what we want to do is in just in a small region limit the acreage or make the setback a little bit bigger. Or I think that people get worried about what happens during the construction process because that's maybe. Uh, more challenging and has more, you know, uh, you know, soil disturbances and so on than the actual, uh, you know, when the solar panels get in. But maybe if we start stepping through the actual requirements now at this point, we might be able to uh, to get it all clarified. Do you think? Yeah, I was gonna maybe before looking at the language is just like let's lay out the um, framework of what we can all reasonably agree on, uh, or at least, um, you know, recognizing that this is a recommend, recommended by law to the town council, they're gonna um, do their own work um, on this as well. Um, and that there is opportunity for uh, minority opinions if there, if there are any um, that um, uh, we can, you know, I, I think this question of whether it's sort of a maybe an overall question of of um uh whether there should be some um outright restriction uh or prohibition i should say um on solar development in forests uh or even forests within a certain region of amherst um i'd like to sort of get some some agreement to move forward how we want to move forward on that question and then we can sort of say, okay, if we don't have, if it's, if we're going to restrict it, then we, the bylaw is pretty easy. Uh, but if not, then, um, okay, what are the areas, as Martha, you were laying out, uh, what are the areas that we want to provide some uh, restrictions around? So I don't, um, you know, I, I hear Janet uh, with sort of a proposal. Maybe it's a straw proposal to to um, uh, prohibit solar development in a certain portion uh, in in forest and at least in a certain portion of, of the town. Um, my my sense of the committee is that that's not a majority opinion um, uh, to go in that direction, uh, and if we can get sort of some understanding of that. Um, then I think we can then in, 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 um, do consideration of, of, uh, Janet's concerns and all of our concerns, um, then move forward with, 
um, how do we want to how do we want to um, do our due diligence and and uh, appropriate sort of protections uh, on some of the concerns. Um, so let me just hear sort of responses on whether or not we want to. Again, this is all a proposal to the town council, uh, but whether we want to pr uh, propose in our bylaw that we sort of have an outright prohibition on solar development in force, in a, at least in a certain area of, of town. Um, Laura, please. No, I was going to say I support that. I feel like we, we keep coming back to a certain set of issues, and I think um, even an informal vote among the committee members, I I don't think it's so if the town of Amherst in general chose to protect chooses to protect certain areas of land from any kind of development that to me is outside of the focus of this bylaw um, and we need to focus specifically on solar where it's not our it's not our job in my opinion to say this is a, a special area and as a result, not only do we want to restrict it, a broad swath of land from solar, but in fact, we recommend that we were restricting it from any kind of development of any kind in the future. That's, I don't believe that's our role. And certainly that's why I, I heard from the attorney that when we, when we outright prohibit solar, um, we're opening ourselves up to um, a lawsuit and, you know, the town certainly cannot afford a lawsuit right now with everything else going on. So I like your idea, Dwayne, of just taking, you know, reading the room and, um, and you know, moving on because we already extended this another month and I'd like to wrap it up and I'm sure others agree. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Martha, okay. so, Janet yeah. and Jack. You are you asked for opinions. I think I think there's a range. I mean, I think that uh, you know we first of all, in response to to Laura, I agree. It's you know outside of our purview to make a final decision. We've heard the pushback that why just restrict it for solar when you could restrict it for you know all types of development. So we could still uh, you know make a recommendation in our report or um, say that's in our report that some members feel that uh, we don't want to just single out solar, that we could make a, you know, we could recommend to the town that uh, if we want to restrict uh, development on solar, it should be, you know, more general. Uh, then having said that, um, I would say that the arguments about the forests uh, are, you know, we have a range to consider. We. Uh, whereas I might personally agree that in the area where we have the private water wells, we might want to say, okay, that's a small area. We could just, you know, re prohibit the solar. Or we could say, well, then maybe let's simply, you know, as we step through the document, consider the setbacks, maybe make so somewhat larger setbacks um, in that region because of the you know, disturbances during construction. Uh, we could say that we maybe want to put, set some limit on the overall size of the clear cut area in certain regions. We have a range to consider, and I would like to definitely uh, co consider some limitations in there. And then we have to remember that in the surveys, public surveys that have been done, you know, most Amherst residents value preserving forests, period. And so I think we should respect that. And I think we should say, uh, well, you know, there has to be some clear cutting, but we really want to uh, limit it and see how much we can uh, do to contribute to um, our you know, solar arrays in Amherst by using other, other sources of land because our residents value solar. So right, thanks. Yeah. that would say okay for now. Yeah. Good. Okay. So um that sounds good. And some of those things we might be we'll take up if we progress to sort of like what are the restrictions we want to uh put forward. So Jan oh, so, moved around. Oh. There you are, Jan. <laughs> um 
I would love to look at the map and look at the what the section that we're talking about and see where the houses are because it might be all the houses are clustered in an area and you know maybe Martha's right like if you have a 500 foot or 300 foot thing you know no array will be built there and it's kind of a sneakier way of a dimensional requirement which Jonathan Murray prefers over you know outright ban um so um so if we can pull up that map and see what we're talking about that'd be super helpful um I'm you know I can so just tell you, you the, the 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 houses are are concentrated around the roads and then there's lots of areas between the roads and then yeah also but if we that kind of remember how you were asking at I think the last meeting or the one I did in July like can we look at the actual property lines like how many five and ten acre you know parcels are available so I think I just let's look at it I'm not sure if we have the logistics to do that at the moment um or the or the time uh okay. I want to sort of just get forward a bit and I think that's homework we can all do because it takes a long time I mean I was on it for like an hour and a half yesterday putting layers on and off and it's really interesting uh and you have to sort of draw your own conclusions but it's really hard to do uh in a short period of time um Jack and then Laura and then yeah I would just say that you know in concept I'm I'm with uh Bob and and what Laura have said um I think you know, existing regulations uh take care of a lot of these things uh Whereas, you know, I, I think if force are uh, uh, unique and special, I think, you know, that that should be established, you know, through some sort of program. But I don't think that's our charge to to say that these woods are are need to be protected when we don't have the legal authority to to do that. Just, you know, I, uh, that's not, but I also want to stress again up up for that corner uh recharge will benefit if the if the forests are gone i mean i it's ironic but i'm just so you know a solo development is not going to be detrimental with regard to replenishing water to the private wells up in that you know flat hills uh area there the you know that just can't really be a legitimate concern all right, good. Laura, and then uh, Chris, and then let's so, kind of hone in on what we want to yeah. do. So, so obviously, you know, I think I made my opinion clear, but I also want to say for the record that I really do not think it's the spirit of this group. Um, Jenna, you made a comment about including sneaky dimensional requirements. It's a joke. Okay. Uh, I mean, um, I I don't, that is not what I signed up to do here. Um, and, you know, I think the world needs more solar. I think climate change is real. And I also know for a fact that developing solar in Amherst without any of the restrictions we're talking about is extremely difficult because of interconnection and capacity limitations. Okay, so that's, so, for all those who are truly anti-solar, I'm not saying anyone here is, but but just as the world exists, as far as like our grid, it is difficult. Period. Um, but you know, I, I'm I'm also so mindful of the more restrictions. I mean, the more restrictions we have, um, in addition to the macro restriction, the less solar, if any, we are going to have in this area. And I'll make one more note. There are tremendous resources out there from the USDA, from a number of sources um, that I've read over the years about how when you put a solar array on a piece of land, you are effectively protecting that piece of land from any kind of development for the next 40 years and how that also has benefits. So um, the world is going to change significantly in 40 years, but I'm just saying. Um, because it's a static type of development and you're not allowed to do anything um, on um, certainly the fenced in area, but oftentimes the entire parcel, 
um, with the exception of now farming, there is a conservation benefit after the construction period to having solar development on a parcel of land. Great, thank you. Um, Chris? I just wanted to remind everyone that um, this solar bylaw may or may not affect um, the proposal for the Shutesbury Road solar. Um, the applicant and the landowner have um, have the right to file a preliminary subdivision plan followed in seven months by a definitive subdivision plan to freeze the zoning on their property. And they haven't done that yet, but they can do that up until the date, up until the day before the town council votes on this solar bylaw. So I wouldn't focus on that particular project when we're thinking about this solar bylaw. We should think about the entire town and what do we want to do in the entire town and where do we have forests in the town and how do we want to treat those. And I just wanted to remind everyone of that, that this may or may not apply to the proposal that is out there. And we should just think more generally about this. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right. Um... I'm going to ask Janet and then Jack to go last uh, and just anything that's new that hasn't been stated before. And then I sort of want to move forward with sort of where we can give uh, Chris uh, sort of maybe a charge to um, draft something for us next uh, to review in detail next time. So, you know, Dwayne, I, you were the head of ECAC when the Climate Action and Resilience Plan was adopted, and it was adopted by the town council. And that really clearly states protect natural working lands for the ecological services, the air, the water, you know, all the good things. That's the state plan. There's a no net loss, you know, coming out of EOEA. We have, if you look at all those plans, including our own town plan, we have experts and people that sat down and all thought of that and came up with these guidelines or recommendations. Um, you know, the, the two climate action plans, we have a state solar survey that says we have 15 to 18 times the amount of built environment that we need to support solar to meet our goals. We probably need more, so it's good that it's 15 times, you know, not just enough. And so like Dwayne, like I don't, to me, it's like, I'm, a, you know, partly being a lawyer or just being in town, it's like, I'm a foot soldier. Like I'd love to implement these plans. And I wonder like, you know, you are the, one of the authors or the lead on this. Is there any piece like sort of addressing Chris's comment is like, we're making a recommendation to the town council of how we handle our forests. And they're incredibly important ecologically. Um, how do we imp how do we implement a plan by allowing you know 40 20 30 acres to be clear cut and maybe it's not just you know i know we i know the shootsbury road is you know in the pipeline but we have a lot of land up there and even though the transmission lines are sort of limited to a certain area that could expand in the future so potentially that whole area could be a series of solar arrays which Laura would applaud, and I know a lot of people would, but it doesn't comply with the state guidance, the state goals, the state policy, our climate action plan. I mean, Dwayne, you were like, I just, I don't know if this is too personal, but you, you were in that plan. And how do we implement that plan without actually protecting our natural working lands in some way? And just saying, this is really important. And it's sort of off limits or very limited amount of um, action there. Uh, well, um, I'm not sure which plan you're referring to. If it's if it's with regard to ECAC, I can um, talk about that. I was not personally involved with the state's plans, um, uh, but with regard to ECAC, and, and I think generally for the state plan, yes, we want to uh, we want to use the built in, and ECAC is very keen on using as much of the built environment as we can. But for I would say foremost. ECAC is really looking to um, drive clean energy uh, and 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 climate um, uh, and and mitigate greenhouse gas emissions to zero, as with the state uh, by 2050. And um, the 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 development of solar at scale 
incredibly large scale compared to where we are now is part of that plan to, to um, con con uh, confront our climate emergency. Uh, and um, and this this no this important notion of net net uh, zero land loss doesn't mean that there can't be any land loss to solar, uh, uh, because while there is plenty of the built environment, there's also expectation that much of that is is uh, while technically feasible, not economically or market feasible, or um, bound to be extremely slow in its development. Um, Time frame compared to the the reductions that we need to meet. Uh, so the fact that there may be need uh, for uh, to use land, forested or otherwise, for solar, absolutely the state and the and the uh, and the town should also be engaged in how can we preserve other land uh, so that there is no net loss. It's net loss uh, that's important uh, for the plan, not no loss. Um, and so, you know, my my sense is that with the, I mean, the town of Amherst is the keen example. We put a lot of land aside, as I understand it, for conservation and encourage them to continue to do so. If they do want to move forward with the forest preserve, that's another in, in my mind, that's interesting and an interesting idea, but a different um, a different um, uh, question, really, uh, and, and process. And likewise for the state, uh, absolutely, the state needs to be working uh, with DCR, with the communities, uh, with landowners, uh, increasing incentives put, to put more and more uh, land in preservation. Um, but that doesn't mean, in my mind, that doesn't mean that in areas uh, where it makes sense to put solar in terms of moving the market, where the distribution lines are, uh, uh, and, and where interconnection can happen, um, that, uh, that those should be prohibited. Um, okay. Hopefully that's helpful, Janet. Um, I don't remember the, or see the order, but let's go with Stephanie and then Jack. Really and quickly. Recognizing the time, I do want to move forward. Yep. Yeah, this is really quickly. So um, Martha lost her connection. She's mm -hmm. trying to get back in. I just wanted to let you all know that. So mm -hmm. I was just talking with her and trying to help her. Um, I just want to point out that uh, the comment's been made a few times. Um, and Dwayne obviously had a very um, significant role in the Climate Action Plan, as did all the members of the ECAC. And I just want to be clear that Laura Drucker was the chair at the time. It wasn't Dwayne. He wasn't the leader of the committee. So I just, I no offense to Dwayne as in his leadership capabilities, but it was Laura at the time. Also, I want to be clear, as I served as the project manager for the development of the Climate Action Plan, that we worked with a consultant and so the framework and a lot of the information that was included in the plan actually comes from the consultant's work. And it was the committee's responsibility to review what they had provided. And yes, it's true that, you know, they definitely supported a lot of what was in there. But I will say this was probably one of the more controversial pieces. So there was some discussion. And I don't know that everyone was like 100% fully in agreement with the final um, recommendation within the plan regarding this piece, but I just wanted to state that so it was clear. Yeah, thank you for that context, Stephanie. Yeah, I definitely um, wasn't the author or the even the prime author or or uh, lead of of ECAC at that point or or today for that matter. Um, and nor do my comments that I just made um, mean to reflect uh, opinions of ECAC, but were just mine. Um, okay, Jack. Welcome back, Martha. Um, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, when Laura mentioned the interconnective, interconnectivity issues, that that um, there there are some factors that where we we do want to fight climate change, and we you know we do want to have solar installations in there, but but that interconnectivity is really a big one, and you know, and it's not like there's going to be wholesale, you know, conversion of, of force. It's just, it's some areas afford that to, to happen. 
and 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 they're very limited in nature. Plus, you know, having the proper size of of the parcel to begin with. So, you know, th- those are just important things uh, uh, to note because I've seen so many projects kind of just, you know, uh, waste away because of the interconnection issues. So um, that's pretty much it. Thanks. Thanks, Jack. Let me um, let me make a proposal um, and then um, try to close out this part of the meeting and go to uh, scheduling our next meeting and then and then the um, public comment. Um, well, while Chris um, uh, has provided a draft that's in our packet today for for. Um, um, forest land special requirements, uh, and then also one for farmland special requirements. I want to, uh, I, I think the farmland one is ready for us to review with her as written next time. The forest land, uh, based on, I don't want to open that up now because um, we don't have time. And I also think uh, I'd rather ask Chris if she's so willing as to revisit that draft to reflect today's discussion. Uh, and my sense is that the draft should be um, uh, should should cover a number of different things, and then we can sort of look at that, and then determine whether this is really special requirements for forests or whether it's basically um, relevant throughout. Um, it seems like we need to have um, we won't have any outright restrictions um, or or prohibitions, I should say, uh, but then certain uh, a, a sp- a particular provisions with regard to buffer, um, whether they're uh, a, a buffer, uh, just like we have for all solar in terms of distance from pub, uh, roadways and so forth and and and, and abutters. Uh, but to the extent that we want anything different, 100 feet is I think our normal restriction or buffer uh, for solar. Um, that seems to be in line with the septic systems for these um, wells of concern. Um, maybe Chris can sort of draft that and, and we'll use that as a as a, uh, a starting point and discuss whether we want to tweak that number. Um, any restrictions? Uh, again, this is probably universal throughout, but areas of areas that have um, sensitive eco, uh, habitats of importance, or I forget exactly what the terminology there, endangered species and so forth, to have restrictions on that or, or prohibitions on that. Um, but that's, again, I think universal. Um, certainly provisions with regard to um, construction and uh, measures uh, for stormwater control and so forth. Um, again, um, the, the 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 special provisions for forests would be if there's anything different uh, and more res- restrictive that uh, and or different pertaining to doing this in forests. Um, I think one question may be: Do we want to have regulations with regard to um, what solar projects in in what 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 was forests are required to do with regard to ground cover? I don't know if we had that otherwise. Um, uh, with regard to, uh, to to Jack's point, is having a good ground cover of, of uh, sort of to mimic a pasture land to make sure that there's roots root systems uh, throughout and so forth that uh, provides the water um, control and, and and filtration and so forth. Uh, and then also, which we didn't really get to today, is just anything with regard to use of chemicals. Um, I forget where it was. It might have been in some of Aaron's work um, with regard to, um, and maybe Laura has some insights here, but, um, and I don't know anything, but apparently there was some concern about cleaning solar panels with some uh, potential chemicals that may be unnecessary or or at least uh, not not uh, anything we want to introduce into the force uh and, and pasture land system uh so anything along those lines um that's sort of the list that i came up with um does that sound 
uh, I'll go to Jack uh, in terms of anything, any any comments on sort of this, just this um, process to get to a draft to review next time with Chris um, or to the um, outline or, or ideas that uh, that Chris should incorporate in this draft. Yeah, those, Jack, those, are, good. those are good, Dwayne. Um, and uh, you thank everybody at the beginning of the meeting. I just want to thank you for for all the, what you've been doing, chairing this. So <laughs> you're doing a great job. Um, but I wanted to say that in, in terms of bringing chemicals in, uh, if if they're biodeg biodegradable, that you know definitely want to state that because there may be something like like antifreeze is very you know does not sustain itself in the environment, for example, but. I don't know anything about that cleaning, but um, I guess I had a question with regard to the setback. And would the setback be to where the panels are or to the fenced area? Or, you know, certainly there's an access road that won't, you know, that obviously uh, would be exempt from, from the setback. Um, but what did Chris have in mind for that? Go ahead, Chris, yeah. if you have anything yeah, in mind. Yeah, so I, I have in mind that it would be to the fence. Um, and there may be a road on the outside of the fence or there may be a road on the inside of the fence, but the fence seems to me to be the limit of the solar array. So that's yeah. what I had in mind. Yep. Okay. That, that, that sounds right to me. Very good. Thanks. Uh, uh, Janet. Um, so, Jack, I, I had, I just realized this. I've been... I had collected some stormwater management um, rules, regulations for solar systems, like from NREL, the National Renewable Energy Lab, which I think is federally funded and some other university. And I think I sent them to Chris, but I didn't send them to you. So can I send those to you and have you look at them? Because they were sort of saying that water, you know, coming off a panel is different from, you know, coming off a subdivision. So. I, I just realized I'm sitting here, I haven't sent that to you. So I'll send them to you. I have no way of assessing that versus the normal thing because it's way out of my wheelhouse. The other thing is I'm glad, yeah, I know where this feels slow, but I, you know, I read Chris's um, stuff last night on a handheld thing because I'm traveling and I really didn't, I read through Jonathan Murray's thing really quickly. So I think I, I don't want to give short shrift to that because I, I read it really fast. And so I think having a little extra time to absorb that on a, maybe a bigger device will be very helpful to me. All right, super, thanks. Um, just if protocol is better for Chris to forward that to Jack, that'd be, let's, um, or, or is it okay for Janet to send that straight to Jack? I think I sent I think she to Chris. Should, she should send it to Stephanie and then Stephanie can send okay. it to everybody. Yeah, and I'll I add it to I, the packet. I think I sent it to Chris and I'm gonna have trouble I'm going to be on the road for the next week finding that, but I'll see if I can find that email on my phone or something, or I'll, I'll work with Chris on it. Can yeah. you re reiterate what is NRAB? Um, it's the National um, Renewable, Renewable Energy, Lab. Energy Lab. And then I think it's from another set from the University of Wisconsin or Minnesota. And I had, I mean, I, I just realized I should have sent a copy to Jack. It's just kind of an Another what with regard to that university? What is, what are you talking about? Um, what type of document is it? Can't You're hear muted. you. Muted. There's stormwater management um, standards for solar panels versus you know the usual suspects. Thank you. Some, thanks. Okay, um, we're running out of time, so let let us um, continue on the agenda. Uh, sorry, that got buried somewhere here. Um, yeah, which is basically uh, the next meeting uh, and, and agenda items. I think the agenda items are really to then to next time. We don't need this discussion. We'll go into uh, assuming Chris has the opportunity uh, to um, look at her draft language for farmland and forest land. Uh, and then we're going to be uh, st starting to be in good shape. Um, there a couple questions. One is we have, um, if we stick with the every other week meeting, um, uh, then we have two left. Um, 
which seems tight to me. Um, and I'm wondering whether there's appetite for meeting every week for October, uh, for September, and then we can have a party on the 6th, <laughs> uh, I guess virtually, <laughs> um, or, or, or finish things up on the 6th. Um, uh, or maybe we should take the two weeks, 15th, and then try to meet the 15th, the 22nd, and the 29th to wrap things up. Uh, but then uh, this is all caveated also with a uh, request from Dan, who is now not available, given that uh, his responsibilities at UMass at this time on Fridays, he's not available for the Friday meetings, um, and whether there is any potential to find another time um, for this um, uh um and end of end of the uh end of the committee um unfortunately we don't have dan here today to know what his alternatives are <laughs> uh, but apparently this time doesn't work um um anybody else have con conflicts with this time on fridays yep bob muted you're muted. I can meet every two weeks as planned, but I have other volunteer activities that actually mean quite a bit to me. I can't just meet willy nilly for the next three weeks. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, let's. Um, well, let me ask. Um, our other times on Fridays, I don't know, again, I this was just a quick email from Dan, so I don't know if he's available other times on Friday, but if that is the case, um, is there an option to meet later in the afternoon on Fridays? Any, any, anybody not able to do that late, late afternoon, later afternoon Friday? Okay, why don't we why don't we um offer that up to Dan uh and see if he's available uh and then we can get back to everybody with regard to to uh, a meeting time still on Fridays um for um for the uh, for the next next meeting. Who uh Dwayne, can I interrupt one second? Can yeah, we please. have a specific time frame like Fridays 1 to 3 or 2 to 4 um and be more specific? Um, well, just, I, I did want to hear a little bit from, uh, Dan on that, but I, I would, I would be. Well, even one to four, like, does he have time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, I mean, one be, to four? I mean, maybe that's an option is let's keep with every two meeting every two weeks, um, which would gives us two more meetings and then maybe a final one on the sixth. Um, but meet for, um three hours <laughs> okay but let's okay uh, so let's um let's think about two to four okay yeah let's think about two to four yeah um but let's not we won't we won't commit to that yet until i we hear back from dan uh mm -hmm. of, of whether that alleviates his conflict okay Okay, uh, quickly, Martha, and then Jan, and then I want to hear from the public. I mean, the only other possibility would be to have some extra meeting at some point that we promised was no more than one hour and dealt with a very specific topic, period. Like, you know, we haven't discussed battery storage much. I don't know if that's a concern to anybody else of what we put in, but that's one category I can think of, or maybe something else will come up. And we could say that would be just one meeting, it would be short, but we'd all think about uh, that one topic and make it efficient. Because I don't think we could possibly do three hour meetings where <laughs> brain dead after two, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it would get into the problem of scheduling such meetings. Um, Janet? 
So I think one of the things that slows us down is, um, you know, like if we were going to look at Chris's draft, it's, it, you know, we got it yesterday and we're all kind of looking at it. And I wonder if we can get things earlier and if people could sort of like have comments on the section that maybe Chris could highlight, you know, like in red. Well, you kind of were doing that anyway with comments. And so I think it's very useful to have some time to read stuff. And then also it's useful to read other people's comments. So I think that might make the meetings more efficient than all of us kind of seeing something, you know, with a with short notice. And I don't blame Chris for this in any way, um, but, and also just look at other people's thinking. It's just, it, I think it will make our meetings more efficient because it's really hard to see something yep. for the first time, listen to somebody, and then we're workshopping language to me. Well, we, just, we had, okay, uh, great, yeah. Um, Agreed. I, I, we'll leave that up to Chris in terms of how soon she can get us drafts. I think the farmland draft is is uh, is in our packet. Um, I actually read through that. I had a couple suggested edits and so forth uh, or, or comments. Um, and if we can all do that and come prepared to the next meeting with specific um, areas where, where we have a question or, or, or a, a suggestion, um, I don't know is if there's a mechanism to share that all like in a shared drive ahead of time or whether that I see I thought so. <laughs> we, we could I, we we could see an earlier draft with people's comments on it as long as it's also posted to the public simultaneously. Yeah, but so that's yeah, I that that satisfies open meeting law and I you know as long you as should, yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah, so let's all just, <laughs> just come prepared with um and, and, you know, maybe uh, Chris can do her read through. These sections are not long read through, but we are sort of well prepared um, and that we're not reading it along for the first time. We're well prepared to say, OK, this this would like to add this over here or, or whatever. Just be real prepared to do that. I just want to quickly say the reason why I pushed back on that is also because it means waiting on getting people's comments and we don't know when we're going to get everybody's comments. So it, the timing yeah. wouldn't really work. Yeah. Okay, Laura. Um, I agree with what everyone said. Um, coming prepared to the meetings to discuss, but I'm, I think we're at a point right now, and I'm speaking for myself and and what I hear others reflecting in the group that many of us have um, other uh, commitments, um, and that continuing to draw out our our timeline, which has been extended twice now, is challenging. Um, and for me, what I'm experiencing is we. We're, we spend a lot of our time in the meetings um, going down these different tangents um, that sometimes are the interest of, of a minority part. So I think I think we got to stop it. And I think we just got to, Robert's rules, take it to a vote, who thinks this is important and move on. Because I, I feel like we'll be sitting here in January mm -hmm. um, talking mm -hmm. about extending the bylaw working group more and more. Um, so th that's the pattern I've been noticing, um, and I don't necessarily have a solution except for when someone feels like we're, you know, um, circular, having a circular conversation, raising it and figuring out a way to move past that. Okay, yeah, appreciate that. I think we're down to brass tacks starting next meeting of, of uh, um, finalizing the language in these sections, and then uh, I'd like to anticipate getting through forest and farms next time uh and uh and, and then um and there's a stormwater section you had as well chris um and then maybe use the last meeting two hour meeting uh to if chris can and she's done some of this already uh sort of put everything together uh and, and use that to sort of um fill in any gaps um and um use robert's rules if we need to uh to uh come to some consensus to come to some final final version that um is ready to be um uh offered by this committee i really have to go bye all right thanks bob okay let me um see if there's any input from the public we have um and appreciate you everybody listening um and so if anybody from the uh, attendee atten other attendees would like to make a comment 
try to limit to, to two minutes or so, um, please raise your hand and Stephanie will move you to the appropriate room. Yeah, great. Okay, R Renee, you are able to unmute yourself and thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, just, just a few comments. I just wanna note that it's 128 and we're just starting the public comments and already a member of your committee has left. So that's a bit of a concern. I would also like to ask the question, how many people from the public have been on this call? Um, I and I would actually request going forward that somebody just tell us at the end of the meeting. I think Stephanie's done that before. So yeah, I think I did mention that at the beginning, but there's six. And I have, I'm particularly concerned about one comment that was made by by someone from the committee in saying that the health, safety, and welfare of the public does not include people who are on private wells. Well, I find that completely outlandish because when you have a house with a private well, it's only because the town has allowed that. The town has allowed a septic and a well. And it makes absolutely no sense to me that we're not going to, um, that, that that is not part of the, what we need to protect in terms of the water. Um, and I just think that that sentiment and that spirit is so not in the, um, in the spirit of the common good and what the town, if the town allows you to, to buy a piece of property and put a private well on it, you, you get it inspected, you, you jump through hoops, and then we're going to say that that has nothing to do with the health, safety, and welfare of the town that only public water does. So I found that particularly offensive. Um, also, in um, KP Law, Jonathan Murphy, Jonathan Murray, had said that, because I keep hearing people say no restrictions on size. And again, I'm concerned about that because he has said that uh, it's reasonable to have maximum lot size limitations in forests. And that he had also said in parenthesis that the attorney general had uh, approved of a 10 acre maximum. So um, I hope moving forward, we will consider all of that and not just immediately jump to no restrictions because I think that's very concerning. Um, so it just, uh, you know, I, I feel like as somebody who's lived here for over, it's lived in Amherst for over 40 years, served, served on, served on committees, ran the human services network to just be disregarded like that and say that because I have a private will that I'm not included in the, the, the gen, in what this town is protecting because I think that's a very um, slippery slope for the town to maintain a position like that in terms of um, the, the risk that, that it, it provides for people who are definitely part of the public. So, um, Thank you. All right. Thank you, Renee. Yep. Um, we, Stephanie, is it appropriate to hear some feedback from the committee members? You're muted, Stephanie. I don't think this is meant to public comment. It's not necessarily have to be responded to. It can be responded to, no, but it doesn't yeah. have to be responded to. Yeah, no, yeah. it's up. It's up to you. As, um, I, it's primarily up to the chair who's running the okay. meeting, quite okay. honestly. All right, well, uh, we have volunteers to uh, make comments. So, Jack. He, um, thank you. I, I, I don't know if it, if Renee was speaking to what I said, if I said anything that, <laughs> to the contrary, obviously all water, uh, uh, groundwaters of the Commonwealth are part of, you know, the, the concerns of public, you know, welfare, health and the environment. So. Uh, I think what I said was that the uh, well, I'm not sure where where that came from. Quite frankly, <laughs> anyway, okay. um, Jack, Jack, it came from me. So yeah, yeah. So why don't we? Uh, all right, can, can uh, comment well, on that, and then, and then we'll go to the next sure. comment. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So Renee, this doesn't necessarily reflect my public, my, my personal opinion, but certainly my understanding, which could be incorrect. Um, from Jonathan Murray, and certainly um, because of my familiarity with with the law in Massachusetts, was that that word public health was not relegated to one individual household. Not to say that 
um, that's not a concern of the town. Um, but when if we were drafting bylaws to protect one or or if we or if a, a community prohibited the development of a solar farm because um, there was concern of it impacting one well, my personal opinion aside, my understanding is that would actually not be legal. Um, so that that's that's where that comment came from. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate that, Lauren. I, um, obviously, we're, we're concerned about um, all the individuals in the town. Um, Steve, you're up next. Hello, and um, <laughs> have a hope you guys have a, a great afternoon after you get out of this meeting. It's a beautiful day. Um, this is Steve Roof. I live in South Amherst. Uh, I am on the ECAC. I am an employee at Hampshire College, but my comments here are my own. Um, first, I wanted to comment on something that came up in some previous meetings about the efforts of the academic institutions in town. There were questions from the public and also on the committee members about what are those campuses doing? So I did a little digging, and this is easily found on the web, but the University, Amherst College, and Hampshire College have either declared carbon neutrality for on-campus emissions. Um, that's Hampshire. We, we have achieved carbon neutrality on for our on-campus emissions, or have pledged to do so. Both UMass and Amherst College have pledged to do so within about 10 years. Um, at Hampshire, we've achieved it with a portfolio of solar that is saving the college money. Uh, UMass and Amherst are spending tens of millions of dollars over the next 10 years or so to reach those carbon neutrality goals by um, efficiency um, approaches, but also changing over their district heating by steam to a lower temperature water and electric heat pumps. So for those people that were curious about that, the educational institutions are making huge investments of time and money, and they're expecting to achieve carbon neutrality in 10 years, about 20 years sooner than the goals of the town of Amherst or the statewide goals. So I hope that hope people find that encouraging that the colleges and the university are doing a lot of work on that front. Um, second, uh, related to today's meeting and discussion, I was got pleased to hear that I think many on the committee are recognizing that renewable energy from solar is far, far safer for our environment and our health and our welfare from fossil fuels. I mean, it's easy to get into the nitty gritty of that, oh, a solar field might affect groundwater. Um, you know, maybe that's a hypothetical. I, I, you know, we haven't seen any evidence that they do. Um, but we absolutely have evidence that burning fossil fuels is literally killing us. 350,000 people in the U.S. die prematurely every year. Um, and the healthcare costs from fossil fuel pollution, $800 billion, billion dollars a year. Um, that's from a Harvard medical school, um, medical school study of a couple of years ago. Um, more locally, that I just read a report by NBC Boston um, News that uh, state records show that there are an average of 120 heating oil spills per year across Massachusetts. Those are direct threats to groundwater and must be cleaned up, often at homeowners' expense to the tune of 100 to $150,000 to clean up. Even, even a few tens of gallons of fuel oil can require that kind of a cost because of its high potential for groundwater contamination. Um, we've seen neighborhoods in Massachusetts destroyed by natural gas explosions and fires. We've seen that recently in other nearby states. So when we use fossil fuels, all of us, we are contributing to these harms, even if we maybe aren't feeling like we're personally harmed. So more solar and less fossil fuels will definitely make our environment better and make us healthier and safer. Um, and Amherst, we've already got more than 30% of the town area permanently protected and more if you count the agricultural land under protection. So we are meeting these goals for forest and land preservations that have been brought up and mentioned several times. We have already met those goals. Um, and what we need to do now is to meet those other goals, which is to develop renewable energy infrastructure that will allow us to achieve the goal of no more fossil fuels. So um, I'm encouraged to hear many of on the committee recognizing this. I just wanted to repeat that from my perspective that renewable energy is far, far safer for our environment than our fossil fuel use. So thank you and, and good luck wrapping up your work. Thank you, Steve.
All right. Uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging in there. We have one more uh, comment. Uh, uh, Eric, um, thanks for being with us. Uh, thank you so much, Duane. Um, I have to say, um, Renee's comment, uh, which was based, was, was um, prompted by Laura's comment regarding the protection of water really only uh, um, covers uh, the public water supply. In uh, January of 2021, uh, the, the, uh, a meeting at the meeting of one of two that year of the Water Supply Protection Committee, I asked as a well owner uh, where uh, my water comes from. And um, Lyons Witten, the chair of the committee, indicated that we don't know, or it's not known where the water supply for wells comes from. So it, um, I am a little concerned that um, not only of, of Laura's comment, but of Jack's comment, that it generally comes from close by. That seems to contradict what the Water Supply Protection Committee's sentiment was. But I also, in at, at that meeting, I asked, well, um, particularly about private water, and I was told that it was the Board of Health that has the jurisdiction for private wells, and well water. And um, uh, when this committee, the Solar Bottle Working Group was um, uh, uh, constituted, was built by um, the town manager, one of the seats on the committee was to be held by the Board of Health and they declined. So in combination with the comment that was made today, the comment that the Water Supply Protection Committee does has no jurisdiction over well private well water, and it is the Board of Health. The Board of Health is on the committee as a <coughs> excuse me as a a homeowner that ha relies on private well water. Which, by the way, the flow rate in my neighborhood is quite low. I'm concerned about who is looking out for our wells. And secondly, I'm, I just, you know, I feel like a Columbo that, you know, I am not a hydrogeologist, but the logic seems to just, the, some of the statements made today just defy logic that if you clear cut a forest, erect acres and acres of, of panels, the temperature goes up, yet I would assume that the water evaporates more quickly as a result of the heat sink that that, that array creates. How can we have more water as a result of it? I just don't, it seems to me that there have been a number of contradictory statements made today. And um, I, you know, it's not comforting, frankly, um, as a private well owner to, be assured that we're going to have more flow. It's not our water is not going to be affected. Well, I at, at that I I really I think what we are doing is doing a risk analysis, and if um and I I wish that somebody could uh you know assure me in very very non risky terms that I will have water uh, in well well no pun intended into the future. So thank you. I thank you. Thanks, Eric, for that. And let me let me um, see Jack hands up and uh, there's some specific questions there. So why don't we have Jack reply to those? Yes. Um, if, you, if you have a, a specific question you would like to ask Eric, uh, I'm, I can respond uh, to it right now. But overall, I think what I, I said that uh, you know, long term, you would have more groundwater recharge in an area that is adjacent to your property. If it were a pasture, whether that pasture had solar panels or not, versus forest. Forests take up a lot of water, put it back into the atmosphere, take it out of the ground. So um, that's just science. And if, I think there was something else in there, but um, 
if you want to ask a, a question to me, please do. No, no. I mean, I, I, I raised the issue of the fact that you su suggested or said that the temperature under the arrays increases. So my question is, and I'm, again, I'm Columbo here. I just don't understand how if the temperature rises and the and it would seem to me that evaporation would increase that would also um limit the amount of water that is recharged and secondly these are panels that are impervious they're not they're not pervious it's not a, the it's not as if the their um the like the rain water will just penetrate through the panels so i'm just kind of yeah. again questioning again i'm not a hydrogeologist i'm just yeah a plain old citizen on a well no i i that very valid concern and it, it makes sense to me as well but what it does there's it's balancing in terms of the hydrologic or uh, water budget it balances a lot of different factors Temperature is one of them, but the fact that like within a forest canopy, a lot of the water doesn't even get to the ground to be able to recharge, all right? It gets caught up in the the uh, the story, the uh, the canopy, sorry, uh, of, of the forest. And and again, the, the grass, you know, in a pasture, the root systems, they don't really, they're not drawing from like the water table like trees are. So trees will prevent water from going, uh, rain from uh, actually contacting the ground in the first place. And then it also has deeper root systems that takes water out of the aquifer. Whereas, you know, a grass or pasture does not have that ability uh, to do so unless the water table is very shallow. So temperature does matter, but all these other things matter. And in the end, you have a, a situation where pastures have higher groundwater recharge on average than a forest. Every place is different, but on average, that's the case. Great. Okay, thank you, uh, Jack, for that explanation, Eric, for the, for the concern for sure. Um, okay, um, we are over time and appreciate um, uh, the the uh, the committee uh, sticking in there, the staff and and the attendees, the public. Uh, just if you didn't hear me before, Renee, we have six attendee attendees from the public. Um, I think I that was the same number at the beginning. Uh, so uh, you all stuck with it uh, and appreciate that. Um, and with that, uh, stay tuned from Stephanie with regard to the exact time of the meeting next time, but it'll be next uh, two weeks on Friday, either at the normal time or at a two o'clock time. Um, and we'll get that information straightened out real soon. Okay, enjoy the rest of your Friday and long weekend, everybody. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, Wayne. Bye.